Circle of Hope Network, doing life and being church together. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So I'm Bill Cork, and my counterpart's running a little late. As I mentioned, he had a clinical pastoral education group this morning for a group of pastors in Colombia. Uh, so it was like 3 a.m. normally is when he has to get up to do that. So he's having breakfast. He'll be over here joining us probably in about half an hour or so. So as uh, Dave mentioned, I'm the one of uh, three assistant directors for Adventist Chaplaincy Ministries for North America. Ivan covers the Pacific Union and North Pacific Union, and he picks up Alberta and BC. I live in Houston, Texas, and I cover the Southwestern Mid-America Lake Union and this conference. And then we have Washington Johnson, who lives in DC, and he covers the whole East Coast. Paul Anderson is our boss, and uh, some of you might know Mario Ceballos, who is our general conference uh, director. What we're gonna do over the next couple of days is a variety of things. Um, Ivan is gonna do more of some practical stuff, kind of, uh, how many of you have had CPE? Couple. So he's gonna, uh, so for some of you it'll be old hat, what he'll do, kind of introduce you to uh, going over a case study and uh, have you doing some of that as well. So it'll be more, ha we'll have a mix of hands-on practicum, some skills training in building, and some that's a little more informative. So I get to do that part first thing in the morning to kind of do kind of an introduction to the whole field of chaplaincy. That's one thing that uh, Dave asked us for, is to kind of a little awareness opening your eyes to where things are at for the whole field of chaplaincy today and some trends going forward that we're looking at. And I'll start with a little introduction of myself and my own journey as a chaplain. So about me, well, I've got to talk about my roots. Uh, so my Canadian connection comes through the Maritimes. My grand-grand-mère, Domitil Leblanc, was an Acadienne from saint Anselm, Nouveau Brunswick. Uh, and we kind of got disconnected from those roots. My great-grandmother, she died when my grandfather was three. He died before I was born. So we pretty much lost that direct connection. Now we knew some of the cousins and so on. Uh, our branch of the family changed Leblanc to white and came very Americanized, though others kept Leblanc and stayed Catholic and French speaking. Uh, but over the last number of years, they've had this event called the Congrès Mondial Acadien, the World Acadian Congress, bringing together Acadians from the Maritimes, from New England, from Louisiana, from France, all the places of the Acadian diaspora, and every five years going to one part of the Acadian world. And for uh, 2004, we had the 600th anniversary of the founding of Acadie in uh, uh, Nova Scotia. And so got to go to these places where ancestors came from, and we had this big concert uh, in downtown Halifax, which started with drumming from s some Mi'kmaq drummers and singers, welcoming us home and celebrating the unique relationships our peoples had through centuries of intermarriage. So that's my own feeling of coming back home whenever I come up to Canada. My wife's family has long roots in Adventist history in Canada. So my mother-in-law, Thelma Longard, was born in Tantallon. Her great-grandparents built the Tantallon Church, which is the first Seventh-day Adventist church in the Maritimes. She then went off to, when she was young, went to Oshawa uh, uh, with her mother, uh, graduated from Kingsway, and my first visit to Kingsway, and I saw Dave and Cam there, I go in the front door and what do I see? The first picture on the wall is my grandmother's class picture from 1942. She went to Atlantic Union College and then started teaching in Vancouver. Got married to a young pastor, Reg Cheney, and where did he end up pastoring? Moncton English, uh, Pugwash, uh, St. John, and that's where my wife grew up uh, in many of those places as well as in the Northern New England Conference. So that just kind of gives us our rootedness. And my path through chaplaincy, 
I'm an Army chaplain. Just finished 20 years, Army Reserve and National Guard on February 28th of this year. It started way back in 1986. The U.S. Army has a program called the Chaplain Candidate Program where while you're in seminary, you can get commissioned as a second lieutenant and begin your Army training. So I did my first Army Chaplain Basic course the summer of 1986 at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And then that fall, they paid for me to do a unit of clinical pastoral education at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, the premier Army hospital. And there's my CPE group and this very young little kid up there. And this is after I graduated from Atlantic Union College where Pastor Mike Collins uh, and I first met. He was a senior when I was a young freshman. So, yeah, local connection here. But I did something a little different, and here's a talk for a, no, a different day. I left the Adventist church when I was in college. I had lots of questions. It was the early 80s. We were listening to lots of preachers with Australian accents, to names like Ford and Brinsmead, and I thumbed my nose at the Adventist church and said, never again will I go near that place. <laughs> now I'm working for the North American division. God has a sense of humor. Uh, but one of the things that I did was I uh, had this sense of connection with other young adults who had questions about faith. And that really drew me to those areas of ministry, especially campus ministry and working with uh, young service members. And that's where most of my life and career have been. So I started out uh, Army Reserve, Vermont National Guard, trained at Fort Bragg during Desert Shield. Also did some uh, uh, training with the Canadian Forces, a couple trips up to CFB Gagetown in New Brunswick. Uh, talk about more of that tomorrow. Did campus ministry full-time for 11 years for the Catholic Church. As I say, this is an interesting story, starting at University of California at Santa Barbara. And then I had nine years, I was director of young adult and campus ministry for the Catholic Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. About a dozen campus ministry centers, 25 staff, a budget of $750,000 for one city, campus ministry budget. And then 2007, felt God calling me back home to the Adventist church. My wife, faithful Adventist through all those years. And I started reconnecting with my old college chaplain at AUC, Rick Trott. He started networking. Uh, our conference secretary in Texas, Doug Kilcher, some of you know, he'd been my father-in-law's ministerial director up in Northern New England Conference. And all of those folks were, you know, I, you come back and you wonder, how are you going to be received? What kind of grilling are you going to get? And instead, they just opened me with, welcomed me with open arms. And three days after I was rebaptized, not knowing what I was going to do for a job, Leighton Holly, the conference president, took us out to eat and over a dinner at Olive Garden, he said, how would you like to be the associate pastor of your wife's church? Wow. Told my kids, you'll never have a job interview like that any time in your life. And he started connecting me with other people doing campus ministry. He said, hey, we need to connect you with uh, those folks. So Alan Martin, who was our NAD director for young adult ministry, Ron Paquel, who was then, still is our NAD director for public campus ministry. I started working with those and got connected with chaplaincy ministries and Gary Council says, okay, you need to get back in the military. So 2009, got back into the Texas National Guard, ended up deploying to Kuwait for a year in 2013. And when I got back, he says, okay, you're coming to work for us. So since 2014, have been now the assistant director for NAD. Uh, last two years from my military career, switched over to the Army Reserve and got a nice position at the Pentagon. Uh, working for our senior Adventist chaplain in the Army, Jonathan McGraw, who is Director of Strategic Initiatives for the U.S. Army Chaplaincy. Brainstorming the future, studying the trends in chaplaincy, trying to figure out where do we need to go? What are the issues that we need to be prepared to work on? Who are the academics doing research in resilience, in uh, uh, post-traumatic stress, moral injury, world religions, uh, the intersection of faith and religion, all of these things 
that's what I got to do for the last couple of years in my part-time Army Reserve job. So some of that uh, is what uh, I'll share little bits and pieces of that, but that just kind of gives you a broad overview of what my experiences in chaplaincy have been like and where I'm going to be coming from. So today I'm going to focus especially in my illustrations on some of the campus ministry and military uh, ministry issues, um, but just as illustrative. Because in chaplaincy today, we have across all the fields, whether it's healthcare, uh, corrections, uh, campus ministry, uh, military chaplaincy, we have a, a much common understanding of what chaplaincy is, how do we do it, some of the ethical norms, some of the standards for care that can inform both your ministry, if you're a chaplain, and I hope your ministry as a pastor. And at any time, feel free to uh, uh, ask questions, raise your hand, whatever. My military experience was really spending a lot of time with soldiers in the field. We talk about ministry of presence. And that's what it was, getting up here uh, with some of my artillery soldiers in the field, having breakfast with them at the bed of a patient. This was for a trauma training I was doing at Brook Army Medical Center. Uh, the public affairs officer said, can you pose for a picture? Sure. Uh, on deployment and got that picture just as I was heading to a crisis uh, for one of my senior soldiers who we were not sure whether he was going to live or not and somebody managed to capture the concern on my face as I was sitting in the back of that helicopter. Met all kinds of interesting people who are doing such amazing ministry even without the title of chaplain. Pastoral care, spiritual care, ministry of presence are not things that belong specifically to the ordained clergy. It's true in the, in the parish as well. This is a little lady who's the most famous, most loved person in the United States Army, especially at Fort Hood. She's kind of small. She only came up to about here on me, Elizabeth Laird. She was uh, volunteering for the Salvation Army. She lived in Colleen. She was a uh, Colleen, Texas by Fort Hood. She was a CPA, did taxes, Air Force veteran. But when 9-11 uh, happened and they started deploying, she wanted to be out there to greet soldiers. So she started volunteering for the Salvation Army and the Command Sergeant Major for her third armored corps, noticed her and noticed her demeanor. And he called him, her into his office one day and says, we're gonna write out a memorandum of understanding here and you're gonna hug every one of my soldiers as they deploy and when they come back. And from 2003 till I think she passed away Christmas 2017, she probably hugged 500,000 soldiers. All time, day or night. First she, would, she and her husband would drive. Then her husband passed away. And then she would drive. And then when she couldn't drive anymore, a friend would take her. When a friend didn't want to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, she would then take a taxi. And so I'd heard stories about her. And I had soldiers who measured their deployments in terms of how many hugs they got from the hug lady. <laughs> and so my first meeting with her was when one of my units was deploying a couple of weeks before we were. And I got to see her and I got my first hug from her. And I noticed this stack of stuff in her hands. And I looked down at it. And there was a Bible and a Steps to Christ. Mm and some amazing facts tracks. I looked at her, I said, you're a Seventh-day Adventist. She says, how did you know? <laughs> and so we became great friends after that, and uh, I got my own hug a week later when I deployed, and when I came back, and uh, then as she fell ill, she got cancer, she broke a hip, and uh, she was in uh, Metroplex Hospital, now known as Advent Health Central Texas. So our ad the hospital right there is a Seventh-day Adventist hospital, too. I got to visit her, and uh, the sign at the door said, don't go in this room without checking with the nurse's station. 
I'm a chaplain, I went in without, uh, and she says, we don't pay any attention to that, uh, a friend of hers. Uh, she says, the only requirement is any soldier, or anybody who comes to visit, they can't leave without taking one of the tracts on the, uh, uh, on the windowsill. <laughs> and there were again, all of her tracts on the second coming, on the Sabbath, how to find peace in Jesus Christ. And I got to see her there a few times in the hospital, and I was going out the door, she says, aren't you gonna wait for a hug? <laughs> And then uh, saw her in the nursing home and a friend of mine, uh, Richard Harbour, who was pastor of the Temple Texas Church and a Navy veteran, he did the funeral. About 2,000 people came out. We had to, they had to have it at one of the big Pentecostal churches. And the governor's wife was there, the senior leadership of Fort Hood, congressmen, senators. And there the pastor was able to preach this message on what was the hope that burned within her heart that led her to want to share this love. Never proselytizing, never hammering people over the head, but just loving every single person. And when I posted about her funeral, one of my soldiers who's atheist, gay, uh, felt rejected by his family. He was in tears because this for him was an example of what Christian love is all about. Can people see the same love in us? The same dedication, the same non-judgmental attitude, the same willingness to be there in times of fear, in times of loneliness, in times of the unexpected. So she's my favorite chaplain, though she never went to seminary. Had some other interesting experiences as a chaplain. There I am in beautiful Kuwait, 126 degrees uh, Fahrenheit uh, that day. It was at 52 Celsius, uh, uh, some kind of crazy thing. But, but it's 126, wind blowing about 50 uh, miles an hour, sand everywhere. Uh, my Adventist service, uh, uh, one of my sergeants. He got home, went to seminary, and is now an active duty Seventh-day Adventist chaplain, uh, deployed to Eastern Europe. Got to do interesting, there's my team uh, in that picture, uh, together with two of the imams of the Kuwait Ministry of Defense, who were amazed when they heard about Seventh-day Adventists. What, you don't drink? You don't eat pork? You don't have pornography hanging in your room? Uh, I said, yeah, and I belong to a church that takes as its mission a, a, a text in the book of Revelation, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship the creator. I said, wow, that almost sounds like the Quran. <laughs> and after that, I was their favorite chaplain. I was the one that they felt that they had a connection with and the understanding we were able to build and I had them come and talk to my soldiers. What does it mean to be an American soldier in the Middle East? What do we need to know about Islam? How do we need to live in this place as people who are there, not to fight, but to build partnerships, to build understanding, to build peace? What is a chaplain? What would you say the definition of a chaplain is? Don't be shy. You're all preachers. <laughs> Somebody? If I hear an intake of breath, that means you're starting to speak. <laughs> Someone that uh, usually serves either in military atmospheres or nursing home atmospheres in uh, practicing the ministries that you were just describing, mm -hmm. ministry of presence, uh, yeah, I don't know how to describe it. Hey, anybody else? Yes. It's connecting people with Jesus by trying to uh, help them to heal their wounds. Okay. okay. Someone who listens with their heart and soul to others who either in their joy or in their grief. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. It's uh, always <coughs> have the empathy and of course listening to patients in the hospital. Okay. Anybody else? 
Some good answers. They really touch on a lot, and I'm going to under a lot of what I'm going to say is underscore each and every one of those points. <coughs> Sometimes, of course, we've already heard it this morning. Sometimes people are also using that term, spiritual care provider or a pastoral care provider as well. And I see that in Canadian circles of chaplaincy, we see more of that more often in the healthcare field than the term chaplain. In Catholic settings, chaplain can be very restrictive as referring only to a priest. Though plenty of nuns kind of thumb their nose and says, no, I'm the chaplain. Uh, I'm gonna be using to start out kind of what our NAD definition is. But how many of you have heard this? Somebody goes into chaplaincy and a fellow pastor says, I hear you left the ministry. Anybody ever hear anything like that? Oh, man, I, I, I deployed. And one of the pastors in Houston was telling people that I had left the ministry. Even though he knew that I'd been deployed. I come back. And I tell the Texas conference that uh, what I was doing, I was, while well, I was waiting for the NAD position to start, I was working as a full-time support chaplain for the Texas National Guard at our state headquarters. No response. I then tell them that uh, I got picked up by the NAD and the leadership writes back and says, welcome back to the ministry. A year later, I'm at a workers meeting at the Texas conference and some of the fellow pastors say, oh, does this mean you're back in the ministry? I looked at him and I said, I never left. <laughs> he didn't know what to say. Our working definition from Adventist Chaplaincy Ministries perspective is that a chaplain is a pastor serving in a specialized setting of institutional ministry. So the chaplains are pastors. We had this kind of a division between chaplaincy ministries and the ministerial department for a long time. And thanks now to Ivan Williams as our division director for uh, uh, the ministerial department, who is also a chaplain. He retired recently as a lieutenant colonel in the Air National Guard in Maryland. And he and Paul Anderson, got my, my boss, got together and said, we need to be working together so that uh, uh, our departments know each other, our teams know each other, so that when the ministerial field folks are out visiting conferences, they can talk about our issues and vice versa. So it was a really rough way to start off. We rented a couple of beach houses together at Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, brought our spouses and had a great time. Uh, and so you'll see more and more uh, when you hear from either of us that we're talking about the other's concerns. Because one of the issues that we deal with is who ordains a chaplain who's not working for an Adventist institution? Who credentials them? I've had chaplains who started out as pastors, they got into chaplaincy working for non-Adventist institutions and somebody forgot to ordain them. Doesn't matter whether they're male or female, their peers were getting ordained after three, four, five, whatever years. They went five, 10, 15, 20, 25, one fella, my first ordination that I participated in, he'd been in full-time ministry for 30 years and never got ordained. I have one pastor I'm working with now, full-time army chaplain for the past dozen years, been in full-time ministry 15 years, had four combat deployments, never ordained. And with all the discussions, of ordination in the Seventh-day Adventist Church today, I scratch my head and say, okay, what does ordination mean if you can be doing ministry for 30 years without it? So what I have to do is build relationships with the ministerial directors of the conference, with the conference secretary, so that we know who they are. And, uh, and had a lot, had to do it in my first couple of years, lots of those conversations. And now, as soon as I know that there's a chaplain who hasn't been ordained, I'm meeting with the conference folks, because NAD secretariat makes us go back to the local conference they're living in to do the ordination and process it through their channels. So that requires us working together uh, in collaboration, coming up with whatever checklist. Uh, some, some say, hey, as long as you guys pass it at your committee, we're good, we'll go with it. But all of this is to just reinforce that there is one Seventh-day Adventist ministerium. Whether chaplain or pastor, 
There is in Jesus Christ, neither black nor white, male nor female, chaplain nor pastor, but all one in Jesus Christ. And we're getting there and we're doing better at that. So if you're not a chaplain, see us as part of the team, as your co-laborers in Christ, just called to work in a different field. To become a chaplain, though, pastors have to have advanced training, pastoral experience with current credentials, and what we offer, ecclesiastical endorsement. So I compare it to the fact that you have a, a physician who's a general practitioner. So say they want to specialize. They've got to have additional schooling, experience. You wouldn't say your cardiologist left the practice of medicine because they became a cardiologist. No, they became a specialist. And that's what we do. And I also tell pastors and ministerial directors, see us chaplains as resources. Some of us have expertise in grief ministry. Some of us, I, my expertise is suicide intervention training. And I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to give you a session on that tomorrow. Some of us have training in crisis ministry, trauma, all these different fields that the local pastor didn't get much on in college or seminary. And as suicides might be something that you face directly once in a lifetime, once every few years. Me, I have multiple suicides a year that I'm involved in. Sometimes multiple suicide interventions each month. So all of us have our expertise and things that we can go to the ministerial meetings, go to camp meeting, and offer and share this with, with the pastors. Theological reflection. Where does ministry start? Where does our theology of ministry start? And we talked about ministry of presence. And you mentioned it. And this is the key text for this. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And if that's true of Jesus, that also needs to be true for those of us who minister in His name. We can't stay in the church office. We can't stay in the ivory tower of the seminary. We have to get out where people are living and hurting and walk with them and live with them. Even though I'm on the road about a third of the time for the NAD, had 120 nights in hotels last year, I still try to stay connected to my local community. As chaplain for veterans organizations, uh, been involved with an institute for spirituality and health, the Texas Medical Center, the world's largest medical center has. Uh, uh, it was part of the spirit, uh, strategic planning for our county public health department. Uh, go hang out with local veterans, student groups, and so on. That's my way of continuing that rootedness and that presence in my community. They're not paying me there to do it. It's not part of my job description. But if I'm a Christian in this place, if I'm a minister in this place, if I'm a chaplain in this place, I've got to be there like Jesus, really, truly connected to the community. So that's a question I ask for pastors. What's in your neighborhood? Do you know the people in your neighborhood? The schools, the teachers, the shop owners, the organizations, the folks at the Legion Hall, the folks at the, the nursing home, the hospital, the people who walk by every day, the kids playing in the park. What kind of connections do you have in ordinary life? The ministerial association, the public health department, the police, the fire. Are you rooted in your community? Do they know you? Do they know your church? Would your church be missed if it closed its doors? How do you take that text to heart? And that means that our ministry in every different place is going to be different. One frustration I had 
as a pastor was when the union came down and said, we're going to do a citywide evangelistic series. We're going to get all the churches from the Southwest Region Conference and the Texas Conference, and everybody's going to be doing evangelism at the same time. I said, great, are you going to come down and meet with us and find out what our issues are, what our needs are, get to know our city, which is now the most diverse city in the United States, more so than New York or Los Angeles? Nope, we got uh, 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 standard PowerPoint slides that were done everywhere else. Let's just do him the, sh the share him slides that uh, are good anywhere around the world and we're going to preach the same uh, cut and dried uh, sermons. We're going to use the same uh, brochures of beasts from prophecy to reach a multi-religious world that has no clue what those beasts mean. mean. Or those postmodern young adults who haven't been in a church and have never heard of the book of Daniel. <laughs> and that was one of those things that just left me shaking my head. And did we have a big impact from that evangelistic series? Oh yeah, we had lots of baptisms, most of whom were the kids in the churches who'd been preparing for baptism. But we counted them and said we did citywide evangelism. Here's a quote that you all no doubt know. Sister White in Ministry of Healing was talking about the problems in the world, about the numbers of suicides, about the crime, about hopelessness in the cities. And she said, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. Yes, you Yeah. Uh, I know this is still early, you know, yeah. something, but I would imagine, you know, how we approach ministry, say, for example, we design a sort of spirit, just like in uh, chaplaincy that we have spiritual assessment tools, mm -hmm. you know, using that. Imagine if we use that for our pastoral ministry in the local churches. Yeah. And it becomes interdisciplinary, you know, and it becomes interrelational. And not just something like we have the message, we preach to them, then bang. You know, then, you know, or something that's really more need oriented, research based, you know, and really based on assessment. Yep. And we will, that, that is something that we will be talking about. Uh, yeah. How can you minister to a community if you don't know it, if you don't know its needs? How, in your own congregation. You know, I was associate pastor at Houston International. I told some of the Jamaicans, uh, Denton Roan is the pastor there now, uh, well known in Jamaican circles. Uh, 50 different nationalities in one church. How can you pastor that if you don't know the different approaches to spirituality, the different questions, the different ways of handling conflict the different cultures have. Do they shout and stomp or do they smile and say, God bless you. <laughs> oh yes, pastor, of course, pastor, anything you say, pastor. <laughs> so yeah, we, we've got to do those assessments and that research and more about that a little bit later. Yeah. I listened to him and, uh, and I looked at the statement that you have placed there and I discovered that you, can, you cannot be an effective minister uh, or a chaplain unless you really reach out to people in a loving way because people don't care how much you know until they know that you care. And so I'm seeing chaplaincy as really caring seeing people and understanding their health needs and so I'm looking at that you cannot really reach people until you are able to empathize and sympathize and almost get into their own truths. Yes. Yes, thank you. The next part of that statement. 
There's need of coming close to the people by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. The poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and the bereaved comforted, the ignorant instructed, the inexperienced counseled. We are to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice, accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of power, prayer, the power of the love of God. This work will not, cannot be without fruit. Wow. Now, we don't have any recordings of her preaching, but I would have loved to hear her preach that. What are we about? We're pastors, not just to a called out ecclesia of people who think like us, but to a profession, an institution, a community that has a mix of people of all kinds of different backgrounds and perspectives on the world and on faith and personal histories, ministry of presence we talked about. Spiritual care. How do you define spiritual care? We use that a lot, often in distinction. We use the word spirituality in distinction to religion. So how do you define spiritual care? Yeah. I gotta think of spiritual care as more broad than just a uh, single denomination. You can provide spiritual care to someone that is not a Seventh-day Adventist and be there for them, practice the ministry of presence, do your job as a pastor to someone that isn't necessarily of the same denomination. Mm -hmm. Am I right? <laughs> Others? Systematic way of promoting health. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just an experience of job shot doing a chaplain and how scientists, they call it spiritual health specialist, not chaplain. And a pagan asked for a prayer for something and I was curious how to pray for that, how to support spiritual support for that. But the, the one that the chaplain is job shot doing just amazed how he prayed, not mentioning God, but just thanking life and thanking the earth. <laughs> and that, I think, spiritual care for that. Mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. thinking. And are we necessarily talking about explicitly religious issues? I think that's kind of an undertone of what we're hear hearing. Questions of meaning, purpose, the human experience. Why am I here? Why am I suffering? Mm. Why did my parents throw me out of the house? had one soldier that I mentioned to you who, he was active as, uh, in his youth group uh, as a teenager, but then he came out as gay to his parents and his parents were very conservative Baptists. It totally disowned him at that point. Their religious reaction turned him towards atheism. And he was just so, so angry towards religion in general but he started coming to my Seventh-day Adventist service in the desert because he noticed that I was taking care of the, the pagans. Uh, I had a, what we call a distinctive religious group leader uh, who was a Wiccan uh, approved by them and, and by the army to lead their worship services. He noticed that when the Buddhist chaplain came in the area, I had him come and do a service and do some training for my chaplains on how to do spiritual care for Buddhists, that I was doing these exchanges with the imams of the Kuwait Ministry of Defense and taking my soldiers to the Grand Mosque of Kuwait, to the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, Qatar, taking them to the, uh, to the Souk al Mubarakia in Kuwait, the marketplace. Uh, he saw that uh, I was taking care of the, the, I was the chaplain on post that was bringing all the rabbis for high holy days. Uh, that I was going to bat for atheists and pastafarians. You know, those are the ones who go to the church of the flying spaghetti monster and wear a colander on their head. Uh, he says, I'm going to start coming to your Seventh-day Adventist church service just because I'm so glad and I want to support you for taking care of all of us regardless of who we are and what we believe. And when we had, we had a dozen sexual assaults in one of my subordinate units on that. And we got back after six months, after we got back, 
they weren't finding support, a lot of the victims, and he told them, go to Chaplain Cork. He's a chaplain that you can trust. He is safe. That's what spiritual care looks like for me. When it's not about, now how many numbers are you gonna to give to the conference office? How many baptisms can you claim? How many people become Seventh-day Adventists? But are people coming to you and looking for you and trusting you when they're in pain and they're in hurt? Yeah, in fact, in Park Manor now, mm -hmm. as a chaplain, we designed a spiritual care assessment form. That's uh, not the traditional one, but even includes, you know, uh, for example, in the spiritual identity, you know, it's not just about Christians, but mm -hmm. even secular, even the SPNR, you know, the uh, spiritual but not religious things, mm -hmm. so that in all those different categories should become more inclusive. In fact, again, in our national organization now, he was yep. trying, you know, to uh, emphasize to them that inclusiveness should not just go beyond religious inclusion, but even the care itself, you know, even the care, the way, the methodology, yeah. and the, even the content itself. Because sometimes when we, for example, there is some of our residents, they are secular, and they said, they have nothing to do with religion at all. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you bring to them the content that we have as religious, but bring to them a different type of content, have to live yeah. with all care. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yes, said it, that you don't have to be spiritual at all. You don't have to be religious to be spiritual because we are all spiritual beings. And so regardless of whether you are a Christian or an atheist or a Muslim, we are all spiritual beings without being religious. Now I had a commander, and my commander on deployment, he was somebody who, he, he started almost every conversation. You know, Bill, I'm not the most religious guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we had such a deep conversation and friendship. Uh, I felt like I was uh, bones to his Kirk uh, sometimes, for you Star Trek fans. Uh, you know, we could, and he said to me one day, he says, you know, I, I, what I love about you is, he says, you're not always just feeling the need to push the Bible in my face. We can talk about uh, old cars, 60s TV shows and music. Uh, uh, we were, I was doing the Command and General Staff course. He was doing War College. We were reading about geopolitics. We could talk about that. He had me give at every staff meeting, start with about five minutes, talking about leadership or culture. What do we need to know about the Middle East? What do we know about Ramadan and how we need to behave when we're doing things with our Muslim uh, partners and, and, and so on. He says, I, he says I, we don't need to start with prayer, but they need to see that you're my key advisor in all these areas and you have something to say and uh, uh, that illustrated it uh, for, for, for me and that friendship and, and were there times that we did talk about the Bible? Oh yeah. Were there times when we did pray? Oh yeah. But we had made this deeper connection first. Uh, a fellow named Isaac Hecker was a convert to Catholicism in the 1840s. He was a transcendentalist. He hung around with uh, Thoreau and Emerson, uh, all these transcendentalist leaders, and he, fa he studied all kinds of world religions, and he ended up becoming uh, a Catholic, ended up be founding a religious order, the Paulists, who are the kind of the leaders in the Catholic Church for uh, interfaith and ecumenical relations and campus ministry. And he wrote a couple of books. He, he said, you know, this was at a time when Catholics didn't do evangelism and they did parish missions which were involved carrying a cross through town, uh, 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 talking to a skull about death, uh, these very extravagant Catholic rituals, uh, maybe whipping themselves uh, uh, in a public way, erecting the crucifix at the end of the mission, uh, very sacramental, very ethnic in its approach, and he says, we're not going to evangelize Protestants and secular people, he said this in the 1850s, with that. So he wore a business suit. He gave lectures at a theater. He wrote books called Questions of the Soul, Aspirations of the Heart. What are people longing for? What are they hurting for? 
And what does the Christian faith give as answers? Basic stuff that we would uh, talk about in some of our classes on how to minister to postmoderns or a secular audience or where there's some hostility. Um, but that's, those phrases still ring with me. The questions of the soul, the aspirations of the heart, that's what we're trying to connect with. But then we also do, as chaplains, religious support. And that's where my job as a military chaplain is that if I cannot perform something for somebody myself, then I make sure that I provide for their need being met. I can't celebrate Mass, so I call the, the, the Catholic priest on the other base and say, hey, can you come and celebrate Mass? Buddhist chaplain, can you come? Uh, uh, Imam, when can we have uh, Juma on Friday? Uh, when are you coming? And so facilitate that providing of those specific religious needs. Some places will have a lay leader, and so I go out and I visit those. We have worshiping communities that uh, uh, in San Antonio, Lackland Air Force Base, which is the main training center for the U.S. Air Force, we've had a Seventh-day Adventist service there for like 50 years. I preached there uh, one time and we had like a hundred kids that were there. Half of them were Adventists who wanted to go there, the other half were the battle buddy who had to accompany them since they couldn't be one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, others came just because, hey, it's something other to do on a Saturday morning instead of cleaning the barracks. And other faith groups can do the same thing. Uh, we, ACM does publish a little brochure that has what uh, summarizes what are some of the religious needs of different faith groups. How do they pray? How do they respond? We didn't bring any of those, but I can send some of those to Dave so that you have that as, as a resource. Crisis intervention, that's one of the biggest things that I do as a chaplain. Uh, and I'll talk more about that specifically tomorrow when I'm going to talk about both trauma and about suicide. Those are the two areas that I respond to. Uh, and, and because I'm known in my community for doing that, when we had a high school shooting at Santa Fe High School a year ago, one of my friends with that county mental health agency called me up and said, can you get down here? And I was there an hour later. That's one of the things that we, have, we, that we are trained specifically to do. And that training makes a difference. We had a Humvee rollover. Armored vehicle, when those roll over, the person in the turret does not make it. Two young men did not make it. I went to our troop medical clinic. Uh, the two that survived were quickly medevaced out of the area. And I'm the senior supervisory chaplain, so I'm just there. My focus was on the docs and the nurses and the staff. How are they responding to what they're dealing with? While well, my chaplains were ministering to the, the friends and the injured. And I just watched two young chaplains. One was a Catholic priest who'd been a hospital chaplain. He's the center of the storm. He was calm. He was doing his ministry, his prayers. And you just saw this peace upon him that permeated the room. I saw my other chaplain who was evangelical, had never done clinical pastoral education, had never done the trauma ministry where we have this thing called combat medical ministry where they immerse us in a trauma room at a major army medical center for a couple of weeks so that uh, we're prepared for the sights and sounds and what a trauma team does uh, so that we can just kind of plug in and, and do our role uh, and not be shocked by what we see. But he was shocked. He had never been in a situation like that. And he just stood there like a deer in the headlights. And you could see the paleness. You could see the sweating. Hit the eyes with the 100 yard stare. Uh, the mouth hanging open. He did not know what to do. So we did a lot of retraining the next few weeks on a lot of that. But that's one of the critical things that as pastors, we never know when we're going to get that call. We never know when we're going to respond and have to be there. There's a video, Baghdad ER. It was a documentary that was done for PBS a number of years ago, looking at a combat support hospital in Baghdad about the year 2006. 
following the staff, looking at how the staff respond to trauma. The chaplain, what does he do? Oh, and he, Dave Schneider, Snyder, he was just uh, an amazing example in that. Uh, I saw him recently, I said, so uh, when you retire, are you gonna go into hospital chaplaincy? He just looked at me and says, no. He says, I've had my share. Um, but it's a great video because it shows you what's happening in a trauma room. How do the staff react to dealing with trauma after trauma after trauma? Uh, how do you provide spiritual care? What do you do? And it's a good learning tool just to be, so that you can be comfortable in that kind of environment. And know this is what's happening, I'm okay with this. Marking time is something that chaplains do. By that, I mean, we have to be there at those critical times. Those celebrations of anniversaries in the military, a change of command in the hospital. Here's Ivan Omanya, my colleague, just come in the door. Uh, when there's a death, regardless of why somebody dies, a military unit has a memorial ceremony separate from the funeral. We do the military honors at the graveside. We have those things of baptisms, weddings, those key events that we're there. Those civic celebrations in the US yesterday was Memorial Day. I preached at a church. One of my AUC classmates says, come in uniform, honor our veterans. And somebody who was there said, Spectrum needs this. And so Spectrum just linked on their webpage to the video of my, ser my Memorial Day sermon, uh, which was also in the context that we are people of peace. We're a non-combatant church. How do we speak of peace in a world today? How do we bring reconciliation? But we have those ceremonial times when people say, Chaplain, I need you. Chaplain, can you say a prayer? Chaplain, can you do the invocation? Think of Barry Black, Chaplain of the US Senate. One of the most visible, the most visible Seventh-day Adventist chaplain in North America. When we had budget battles, there was Barry praying on CNN, forgive us our foolishness and bring us together. <laughs> Barry can speak truth to power, and he does it in such a deep voice and such mellifluous words, and they love him for it. But that's how much of what people expect of us as chaplains, that public persona, that public role. <coughs> we have to be there. We have to be that presence of the sacred that presence of God, that presence of peace. And we have a holistic approach. You know, that's what I love about the Seventh-day Adventist message. It's not about just getting the soul into heaven when somebody dies, but that Christ came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. In my work in the Pentagon, we were part of a team developing a, some approaches for pastoral care of our senior leaders, our general officers. And the chief of staff of the army put this emphasis upon all the section leaders when a three-star general died by suicide right after being promoted to his third star. And he says, how can this be that a senior leader who has such responsibility, people respect him, he's got a great family, how does he do this at such a critical time of his life when everybody's celebrating his accomplishment? And you know, there was a spiritual autopsy that was done and uh, he was uh, insecure. He didn't think he was prepared for it. And then you add alcohol to the mix and we did studies of, and listening groups, focus groups of different general officers. What are the issues you're dealing with? And all of them talked about the loneliness that happens when you pin that star or that maple leaf in the Canadian military on your uniform. 
when you become that conference secretary, that conference president, when you become the chief of staff for a hospital or an administrator, people don't tell you the truth. People want to say yes to all your great ideas. Your old friends don't look at you in the same way. And these are all men and women who are in their mid-50s, dealing with aging parents they talked about. The stress of that, about kids becoming adults and moving out and moving back in. Uh, about now being told when they're on a flight visiting somebody else, oh, you're being moved to a new command, the, the moving van will be at your house tomorrow morning. And we had to see, well, how do we pastorally support that? And we're working in that as a team. And they brought in a, a, a bunch of leading chaplains. And some are really pushing a very biblical approach to it. Things from like uh, 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 some Rick Warren type stuff. And, uh, uh, and my boss pulled me aside. And he says, can you see the difference that we as Seventh-day Adventists bring to this conversation? Because we're, we automatically are going to look at the whole person. The spiritual, the physical, the wellness. How are you, what are you eating? What's your diet? What are your relationships with? Are you finding meaning in your work? And look at it in a much more holistic perspective. And we've had that tradition in the military chaplaincy. So that uh, my boss, Jonathan McGraw, he also, when he was a major in Hawaii, he developed a program for marriage retreats that the army called strong bonds and adopted and every chaplain is trained in how to do this retreat program for married couples, for single soldiers and we use a book called How to Avoid Marrying a Jerk uh, by John Van Epp uh, wrote that. Uh, uh, we do it for families but it came out of a Seventh-day Adventist chaplain saying how do we care for people going through relationship issues? What's the whole wellness approach that we need to do here. The uh, our army chaplaincy years before that started a specialization for family life chaplains. That we need to have chaplains who go, uh, that the army pays to get a master's in marriage and family therapy. And we have a training center at Fort Hood. <coughs> they do their clinical hours there and then they get their degree from uh, uh, Texas A&M. Who started that? A Seventh-day Adventist chaplain, Dick Stenbachen, uh, uh, in uh, Vietnam, the commander said, you know, we really don't know much about the worldview of the people that are around us who were supposedly keeping safe for democracy. And a chaplain said, well, let's study their worldviews and their religion, their spirituality, how it differs from the Montagnards to the uh, South Vietnam uh, uh, the rice paddies to the n uh, north where people are in the highlands. That was a Seventh-day Adventist chaplain, Bob Mole. Uh, when we're also looking at some of the wellness programs, we reached out to Advent Health. Use their creation health material. I, I brought in the volumes of the creation health material from Advent Health into the Pentagon, into the chief of chaplain's office, and I had multiple colonels coming up. Wow, that looks really cool. What is that? And just kind of out the side of their desk walked them through creation health. I said, wow, this is really cool. Can we start using this? I said, that's the plan. So that's something that we bring that I think is a gift that we don't often really affirm and treasure. The word social justice is one of those scare words these days. Some people don't want to use it. I found this great sermon from the mid 80s of an uh, Adventist leader who was invited. This is after, uh, uh, so it was late 80s, so it was perestroika time. And Adventist leaders were invited to an interfaith thing to talk about the future of Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union. And this Adventist leader talked about peace. He talked about uh, uh, th what we as believers need to do to bring peace to the world and how you can't have peace without social justice. And he looked at the different constituents' parts to social justice. It's an amazing, a powerful sermon. A guy named Elder Wilson, General Conference President, Neil Wilson, gave that talk, that resounding emphasis on the need for social justice. Um, so 
If anybody says, why are you talking social justice, say Elder Wilson said I could and should. But that's part of this holism, that we're not concerned about just getting people into heaven, but caring for the whole person. As Sister White said, we're concerned about the poor. We're concerned about the situations that got them there. We're concerned as a church, that's why our early Adventist pioneers were abolitionists. They believed in uh, 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 disobedience, in civil disobedience. The law of our land requiring us to return a slave to his master, we are not to obey, said Ellen G. White. So we care about the whole person. I was meeting with uh, some of our, uh, one of our Adventist hospitals recently, and they were talking about some of the connections they were making in the community, and we were brainstorming. You know, how do we deal with the issue of veteran suicide? Well, we need to have these networks of support. The Adventist Healthcare, the VA, the other hospitals, the other community mental health agencies, the churches. I do a program for the VA, the Community Clergy Training Project where we go out to clergy groups and talk about you know, what are the issues faced by the veterans in your uh, congregation, their families. What's it like for a reservist who's deployed? What's his uh, or her family dealing with while they're gone? What's it like when they come back? What are the hidden wounds of war? How can, pa because a soldier or a veteran who's dealing with pain and combat trauma is more likely, or thinking about suicide, is more likely to go to a pastor than to a mental health professional. So that's kind of the approach that, uh, and the other chaplain that in Houston was doing this with me, the full-time chaplain at the VA, Seventh-day Adventist <laughs> chaplain, seeing that this is a way that we can get out into the community and try to help facilitate these connections so that we're caring for the whole community, we're caring for the whole person. So does this resonate with your idea of what chaplains are about and some of the things that we're doing? Let me get into a little church bureaucracy. How many of you have a copy of the NAD working policy? The ministerial director, the conference secretary, the rest of you. We have a great section about chaplaincy. Paragraph FA05, Philosophy and Mission of the Adventist Chaplaincy Ministries. The mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the purpose for Adventist chaplains are one. God created a perfect universe based on principles of divine love and law, but Lucifer's rebellion disrupted the union between the creator and the created, causing disharmony and separation. Then God created man and woman in his own image. Did you know working policy was theolog theological and Christological? Uh, whole and complete with a mosaic of characteristics in the physical, mental, emotional, volitional, relational, spiritual, and sexual realms. We got sex in the working policy. <laughs> Tragically, sin plunged the human race into crisis and brokenness, creating the need for restoration. Christ addressed this need for reconciliation and restoration when he declared his mission was to seek and save the lost, call sinners to repentance, and offer more abundant life to whosoever will. Jesus defined his ministry in the words of Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then it quotes that paragraph from Sister White, Christ's ministry alone. The work of Seventh-day Adventist chaplains is an essential and dynamic element of this mission and ministry of the church. As commissioned, licensed, credentialed ministers of the church, chaplains labor for people at significant crisis points in their lives, caring and restoring, as did Christ. Working in diverse settings, community and government agencies, correctional institutions, healthcare facilities, military installations, schools and the workplace, they are the presence of the church, often in places where the church would otherwise have no ministry. I love that. I love the fact that working policy isn't just about policies and compliance. It's about giving us a vision of Jesus Christ.
Workplace. Do you know there are railroads that have chaplains? You know one of the biggest corporate employers of chaplains is Tyson Foods. Chicken processor. The head of chaplaincy is, uh, uh, right now it's Karen Diefendorf. We're not, she's a retired army chaplain. We did the army chaplain basic course together back in 1986. Um, how many of you seen the documentary, The Chaplains? It was made a couple of years ago. And, and this, the guy who did it, he also did, he's done, uh, uh, did some on Adventist uh, education too, <coughs> the blueprint he called it. But it's just called The Chaplains. And it interviews chaplains in every uh, sphere. It talks about the folks at uh, Tyson Foods and what they're doing on the, in the processing plant. Uh, talk to uh, Paul Hurley, at that time the senior chaplain in Afghanistan, who right after that became the army chief of chaplains, uh, as he's going around in full battle gear visiting chaplains and, uh, on the battlefield. Uh, hospital chaplains. Here's a chaplain, a rabbi, to a uh, uh, a retirement home in Hollywood for retired actors. And he's a, he, he was an actor who then became a rabbi afterwards. So it really looks at chaplains in so many different areas and tells the story. And Barry Black is in there too. <laughs> now, here's the picture in Canada. The number of chaplains that we have endorsed as I looked up in our directory, not a whole lot. Six in healthcare, two corrections, two campus. One is Cam Page, who's now uh, doing First Nations work, and uh, there's Adam Dybert, who was at Berman and now is at a care home. One community chaplain. Uh, who, uh, we have the conference president in Ontario, who's a longtime police chaplain. We honored him at Oakwood last December. And we've had four chaplains in uh, uh, the reserves the Canadian military. None at present. We've got one who we're hoping to get back in, maybe even on active duty uh, very soon. Yeah, I was just saying I'm in healthcare. Yes, we have a healthcare chaplain endorsed by us. Um, so, of course, there are plenty of you who are working as chaplains who are not endorsed. That's one thing we realize, that not every field of chaplaincy requires endorsement. Uh, the military does. And one of the harder things about, in the US, each denomination is its own endorser. In Canada, you either have to go through the Canadian Council of Churches or through the evangelical group. They don't recognize individual denominations. And so that's been one of the sticking points here to get on active duty is get signed off by one of those big umbrella groups that sometimes we're a little nervous about how do we want to be a full member of an associate of the World Council of Churches. We have not been comfortable about doing that. We've had good relations with the evangelical group and I th that's where we're, we're, making, we're making progress because each country does it a little differently. Healthcare chaplains, some hospitals say we want you to be endorsed or some uh, care homes, others don't. Um, but if you want to be board certified as a healthcare chaplain, Ecclesiastical endorsement is something you have to have, and that's usually when our healthcare chaplains come to us. We want to be board certified. Can we get endorsed? And we're going to endorsement in NAD is the recognition for a specialized ministry. For most ministries, it requires an MDiv of at least 72 semester hours, except for campus ministry. If you have a 48 semester hour uh, master's in uh, pastoral ministry or master's in youth and young adult ministry that will be enough. Have a license or credential and for those who are working for non-Adventist institutions we do the credentialing. Pastoral experience and if somebody has not had pastoral experience we have a memorandum of understanding and agreement where somebody works with their pastor just to do a checklist. Okay I've done all of these areas over a couple of years of ministry in the congregation. And then some require specialized training like CPE. So we do that, we do an interview uh, with the prospective chaplain, we then take the name to our NAD committee, and for Canadian chaplains then we send a recommendation then to the uh, SDACC so that it's the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada that is actually doing the endorsement for Canadian chaplains, though they use us to do the vetting and the paperwork and the recommendation. 
So that's just the process. Who do you think was the first Seventh-day Adventist chaplain? And where did they serve? Any guesses? What's that? No. He did many different things. No. Now, I don't even have his name off, but he was, a, he, he was a chaplain at Battle Creek Sanitarium. In like the, you, do you remember his name, Ivan? I remember his first name was Rufus. Rufus, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but Ellen White was working with Dr. Kellogg uh, and saying, you know, what's, what should the dis job description of a chaplain look like? And it's great. It's of great importance that the one who's chosen to care for the spiritual interests of patients and helpers be a man, she only was thinking of men in those days, of sound judgment and undeviating principle, who will have moral influence, who knows how to deal with minds, should be a person of wisdom and culture, of affection as well as intelligence may not be thoroughly efficient in all respects at first, but should by earnest thought and the exercise of their abilities qualify themselves for this important work. The greatest wisdom and gentleness are needed to serve in this position acceptably, yet with unbending integrity, for prejudice, bigotry, and error of every form and description must be met. This place should not be filled by one who has an irritable temper, a sharp combativeness, Care must be taken that the religion of Christ be not made repulsive by harshness or impatience. The servant of God should seek by meekness, gentleness, and love rightly to represent our holy faith. While the cross must never be concealed, he should present also the Savior's matchless love. The worker must be imbued with the spirit of Jesus, and then the treasures of the soul will be presented in words that will find their way to the hearts of those who hear. The religion of Christ exemplified in the daily life of his followers will exert a tenfold greater influence than the most eloquent sermons. If all connected with the sanitarium are correct representatives of the truths of health reform and of our holy faith, they are exerting an influence to mold the minds of the patients. Notice, it's not just the chaplain who's doing the spiritual care for the sanitarium. If all connected are representatives of the health message and the faith, they're exerting an influence to mold the minds of their patients. The contrast of erroneous habits with those which are in harmony with the truth of God has a convicting power. That's uh, Testimonies, Volume 4, page 546, 1878. Anything in there that's different than what we're pushing on today? Now, that intelligence, you know, that's why we require the academic work and, and, and in different professions we're pushing for higher level to get the doctor of ministry, to get the PhD, to get the extra certification and uh, uh, to be a licensed pastoral counselor, to be a bioethicist, whatever, because there's these intellectual demands in the intellectual environment that are expected of us. Uh, I was part of an interdisciplinary team on the neurosurgery ward of Walter Reed. Man, that was one of the most challenging things of my life. CPE wasn't giving me any didactic content about what happens to people with traumatic brain injury. But we had the Army's Institute for Head Injury Research there, so I spent time with the researchers. Tell me what to read. How does this affect relationships, cognition, emotions? What am I seeing in these patients? How can I understand them better? And I also knew that the other members of the IDT didn't care if I wasn't an expert. They were interested in what I did have to say about what the family's needs were that they weren't seeing about the patient's experience of them that they weren't picking up on, about how they could deal with the stress of dealing with patients in those situations. They saw that we all had that role to play and that was one of the most affirming things for me as this young chaplain, 24 years old, second lieutenant, chaplain candidate, lowest ranking person in, in the chaplaincy office, still trying to put this stuff together. And yet when I walked onto those wards, being greeted by all the staff, 
with smiles and expectation and hope after a death staying there then for hours to minister to the family member or the the, the staff the patients uh, uh, the, the, the staff uh, on the ward yeah that was one of those things that made me fall in love with it they're not looking at us as just why is he here but rather thank God you're here any thoughts about that Sister White, description. Well, I've mentioned our office, Adventist Chaplaincy Ministries for NAD, and the main thing that we do is endorsement, as I said, in collaboration with SDACC. We do the credentialing for those employed by non-Adventist institutions. We offer continuing education. So we have our Seventh-day Adventist Healthcare Chaplains Association that meets next month uh, uh, in conjunction with the uh, Association of Professional Chaplains uh, in a Disney park. Uh, so, going to have some fun with Mickey Mouse. Uh, uh, no? N no fun with Mickey Mouse? We're having fun with Shamu at SeaWorld. Oh, Shamu at SeaWorld. Have you seen Blackfish? Uh huh. Uh, and we give money, a thousand dollars a year, for uh, endorsed chaplains to do continuing education. We're having our military chaplains conference at Colorado Springs. We're going to do tours of the Air Force Academy, go up into the mountains, have some fun, and then we ask of chaplains that they do an annual report and that they submit their annual report on time. <laughs> We've been talking. <laughs> we also have the Adventist Chaplaincy Institute, and Ivan's going to be talking about that. Uh, he's got some handouts on that. Uh, and we're doing our own board certification now, and Ivan is the chair of that, and also looking at having reciprocal relationships and being accepted as a full uh, team member with the other board certifying bodies so that like the Catholic chaplains, the Jewish chaplains, APC, we are recognized as one of those professional organizations giving an equivalent board certification. So Adventist chaplains are at the lead of the profession in every field of chaplaincy and Ivan can share a lot more about that. Just looking broadly at the field of chaplaincy, we have all these different associations. APC I mentioned, the American Association of Pastoral Counselors just this year merged with them, the Association for Clinical Pastoral Education, National Association for Catholic Chaplains, National Association of Jewish Chaplains, and the Canadian Association for Spiritual Care. All are cognate collaborative groups and they all share a common code of ethics and standards of practice. And as members of these groups, we share this common perspective on what chaplains should be able to do and how we should be doing this ministry. And you're going to be, are you going to be talking about some more of this stuff too? So I'm just going to highlight a couple of things just again to give this context and what we've talked about. How do we care for the individual person? Each individual possessions dignity and worth. The spiritual dimension of a person is an essential part of the individual striving for health, wholeness, and meaning. Spiritual care is a critical aspect of the total care offered in the delivery of care for public and private institutions. Inclusivity and diversity are foundational values in pastoral services and are valued throughout the structures of our organizations. Public advocacy of related to spiritual values and social justice concerns is promoted on behalf of persons in need. We're gonna tr members will treat all persons with dignity and respect, serve all persons without discrimination, regardless of religion, faith group, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, age, or disability. Can you serve everybody that comes to you? Now, some things in terms of religious support we can't. I cannot hear a Catholic confession. I cannot do a mass. But can I counsel that Catholic priest who comes to me needing somebody to talk to? Can I be there for 
my Buddhist colleague, that atheist soldier, that gay, that transgender individual. This is becoming a dividing line in some areas of chaplain speed, especially the military. Because we focus so much on religious support and doing religious things, we have some chaplains on the evangelical and fundamentalist side who say, well, I don't have to do things for anybody that I'm uncomfortable with. And their endorsing agencies have come out with statements. Uh, no, if it's a uh, lesbian commander who's having a change of command ceremony and her spouse is there, you don't have to do the invocation if it's against your religious beliefs to recognize anybody in a gay marriage. And some of us start to think, and it's like, well, you know, if we can't do an invocation or a benediction based on who the commander is, or we can't do the invocation at the banquet if they're serving some pork dish, or we can't do this, or what are we left doing? If we can only serve those who think like us and act like us, how are we cutting down on our responsibility and our availability and on the ministry that we can do? Especially if you're with a hospital or a nursing home. You're not going to last long as a professional chaplain at a public hospital if you say, well, I can't see these patients or those patients. But you're, you're, you're their chaplain. Yes? Just a personal experience, you know, when I was still a pastor way back years. And uh, I remember being active in a ministerial association. In fact, when the Catholic priest was sick, I visited him. I was the one mm -hmm. who also first visited him when he was sick in the hospital. And firstly, when I suffered loss, and uh, the first one who visited me was not even a Seventh-day Adventist pastor or from mm -hmm. uh, the conference itself, but it was a reform minister and a couple. Mm -hmm. When Seventh-day Adventists were imprisoned in Leavenworth as conscientious objectors during World War I, no Adventist chaplain went to visit them, but the Mennonite pastor did. And that's how we know who the names were of the Seventh-day Adventists, because he kept careful notes on who the Adventists were, who the Quakers were, who the Mennonites were. Um, my wife and kids have been hospitalized many times. My wife was faithful Adventist. I could never get a Seventh-day Adventist pastor to go visit my wife in the hospital. They always gave excuses. <laughs> and some say, well, nobody told me. Well, I told them. I called them. <laughs> but state chaplain for the Vermont National Guard, Catholic priest, he came to see her and brought a bouquet of flowers. Connie Parvey, Lutheran pastor, she went to see her. I was having lunch with John Pauline at Loma Linda. At, uh, we were at uh, Chipotle. I got sick. Food poisoning. Maybe norovirus. I, it was bad. I got to the restroom. I did not have to spoil anybody's lunch. He took me to the Loma Linda urgent care. One of the chaplains heard I was there. Oh, he came. He started spreading the word. Next thing you know, every se single Seventh-day Adventist chaplain at Loma Linda was coming to visit me. And they all wanted to talk about the upcoming conference or whether their annual report was accepted or this, that. I said, shut up. I'm a patient. Pray for me. <laughs> <laughs> this gay atheist soldier that I mentioned, he uh, told me that in basic training is when he came out and he wanted to talk to a chaplain just about the reaction that he was getting from his parents. First chaplain, his battalion chaplain, started giving him a Bible study on why homosexuality was wrong. He said, I don't want to talk, I just need to talk to somebody about my feelings. The chaplain refused. Referred him to another chaplain who refused. Referred him to the brigade chaplain who refused. Here's this private who has to go to the uh, colonel, the senior chaplain, and at that point, the highest ranking person he'd met was a captain in basic training to find anybody who was even willing just to talk to him about his pain, anguish, suffering, 
because his parents had rejected him. I taught a suicide intervention course at a military base a couple months ago and there were two trans women in the, in the group, active duty Navy personnel, but you know, fully respected by everybody there. One was a senior NCO who the next day I happened to see a report on transgender issues in the military and she was one of the people uh, interviewed because she's become kind of a national spokesperson for transgender issues in today's political climate. Uh, uh, but they came up to me afterwards and said, hey, we're just so glad for this training that we were accepted by everybody and affirmed and listened to and our experiences respected. Is that what people say to us when we do our ministry? Can we get that information? Are you giving me a five minute warning, Ivan, or wanting to say something? No, well, I just wanted to, because I just came across this last week. Okay. Uh, a patient in a nursing home was having a very, very tough time because she had lost her pet. And a chaplain went in there and told her she needed to get over it because her pet didn't have a soul. Mm. <laughs> And so I had, to, I had to sit down with that person and read to that person Romans 8. You ever read Romans 8? Mm. Creation is waiting for the manifestation. Mm. Mm. Um, and then we cried together. I asked her to picture Jesus holding her dog. And it changed immediately. Yeah. All because somebody is not willing to put aside their thoughts and be with the person in front of yeah. Yeah. I, My pastor when I was a kid was a legalist. One of the youth in the church was honored by this citywide thing and they had uh, uh, the newspaper was honoring young people and so they had each of the honorees up on the dais that their pastor, they were serving steak, and the Adventist pastor in front of everybody stuck his fork into the steak and said, anybody want this? I don't eat the stuff personally. He was known to go into a home to visit a wife, and before even being introduced to the husband, he sees a pack of cigarettes and says, you know those things are going to kill you. He just fellowshiped my mom, who... My dad was out of work, uh, early 70s. Uh, my mom was a nurse, picked up some extra income by working at Sambo's, uh, old pancake house that used to exist. Uh, and uh, under the stress, she was returned to smoking. And church was said there was going to be a business meeting after prayer meeting. Well, there were three people at prayer meeting. I was one of them. And at that uh, business meeting is when my, wife, my mom was disfellowshipped. <clears throat> he didn't bother to come visit my mom to say that this was going to happen. He asked me, so is she still working there? Is she still smoking? I was 14 years old. The church clerk was there. She said, I'll tell you, your mom. She never did. Came up a year or so later and my mom found out. And I asked the clerk, why did you never tell her? Well, she was a friend, and I found that hard to do. And I wondered, you know, I was so angry at that situation. I go to Academy the next year and say, you know, my mom just got disfellowshipped for working at a restaurant on the Sabbath. I would feel uncomfortable working in the cafeteria on the Sabbath. No sympathy whatsoever from the principal thought I was being legalistic. When that pastor died, he had kids my age, the family found out something about him. They knew he'd been in the army in World War II. He was a medic. He was a medic on Omaha Beach on D-Day. Seeing his soldiers being blown to bits left and right all around him. And as an army chaplain, I reflected back, what did that do to him? How did he seek to try to find order and meaning in his own life? 
What kind of a wall or hedge did he build up around himself and his heart to protect himself? What are the things in our lives that cause barriers to us in being compassionate and ministering to different people? What are the things that hook us, tr trigger us, are obstacles to effective ministry? That's why we do clinical pastoral education. That's why we need people that we can talk to. That's why when we're going through ministering in traumatic situations, we need a counselor that we need to be seeing to process our issues. Whenever somebody rubs us the wrong way, that's when we need to ask, okay, what's it in me and my history that's keeping me from ministering in this open, affirming way? You know, I'll just, uh, uh, again, this goes, this goes on. Uh, we do not engage in sexual misconduct. Do you know where to draw the boundaries in your ministry? The number of pastors that were friends of mine, one became an academy Bible teacher. He was the one thought most likely to, to succeed in ministry. He went to prison for two years. Most of the Catholic priests that I knew in the military chaplaincy in Vermont either went to prison or were forced out of the ministry completely. Um, standards of practice, Ivan's going to talk more about standards of care. Um, care for the whole organization. Important in each area that we see, it's not just the soldier that we're responsible for, but the commander too. Not just the student at the university, but the professor. Not just the patients in the hospital, but the staff, the administration. Clinical pastoral education, also in Canada you hear the term supervised pastoral education, pastoral counseling education. We have three different associations, so you have Canadian Association for Spiritual Care here, ACPE, CPSP, Ivan's the expert in those distinctions, but lots of other people who are offering clinical pastoral education. Campus ministry, I got a couple minutes, but we're taking our break at 11. Um, this is an area that we're really not doing enough in. Do you know when the first Seventh-day Adventist said that we needed to be doing ministry on the public university campus? little old lady from Gorham, Maine, named Ellen White, was saying that in 1895. She was seeing these land-grant universities being established in the United States. Now, after the Civil War, federal government saying, we need to build up education, especially in engineering, especially in agriculture, these things that the nation really needs these skills as we expand, as we build up. So the great universities like Texas A&M University, my daughter graduated there with her master's in veterinary public health and epidemiology in December. Uh, <laughs> uh, in Michigan, it was University of Michigan and Ann Arbor was established then. And that's the one. She's in Harker Heights giving this talk saying uh, that, uh, uh, you know, we need to be reaching out and involved in these public universities. She's got Battle Creek College starting, but she's saying we got to send some people to the University of Michigan to get degrees in medicine. We need to send them there, not as evangelists, but as students. We need to send them there to be like the Waldensians. Just live there, take classes, live an example, and talk about your faith when people ask questions. That's the same time that the Newman Centers were started by the Catholic Church, the Wesley Center. All the major denominations were all setting their campus ministries up at the exact same time, late 1880s, early 1890s, all in response to the same thing, and we never really did anything about it. Now we have Adventist Christian Fellowship is our NAD ministry for public campus ministry. And we have a GC office, public campus ministry, headed by Jiwan Moon and Ron Pakel does ACF. 
We can come out to a church, uh, and we did this for the Alberta conference. Uh, 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 Ron and I did uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, we do a weekend program called Campus Catalyst, which is meant for a team at a church near a university or a group of students and faculty on a campus just to jumpstart campus ministry. We have a week-long program, Adventist Christian Fellowship Institute. Ivan was at that last week, and we have our campus chaplains come to that. There's a couple of conferences that are really doing great things in hiring pastors as public campus ministry chaplains. Michigan is one. Large campus ministry uh, department. Georgia Cumberland is the other. Those are the two leaders. Uh, a couple of others have hired some individuals here and there. Southern New England just hired somebody full-time that can be an endorsed chaplain at Harvard University. My home church was New Haven, Connecticut two blocks from Yale University. I preached there 10 years ago with a sermon that I give for churches by university campuses called, Come Over to Academia and Help Us. The elders who knew my mother when she was a teenager, knew my great aunt when she was in her 20s, they said, we've never had a pastor preach that kind of a sermon saying we have that kind of ministry in this neighborhood. Two blocks from Yale University another few blocks from Albertus Magnus, another few blocks from other universities in downtown New Haven, Connecticut. This is context. Do you have a university nearby? What are you doing to reach out? And there's a difference between having a student group and having a chaplain. Texas A&M, 20 years ago, they had this disaster. They built this bonfire of, like, of great logs that was like 100 feet high. They did that every year before the annual Thanksgiving game against the University of Texas. And they made some mistakes in building and it collapsed and killed almost a dozen students. And it took days to just pick the thing apart and find the bodies underneath. But there, at this state university, they had a group of chaplains that met with this Dean of Student Services, all the endorsed chaplains. And they called upon them in that time of crisis and said, we need you out here. That's the difference that endorsement makes in public university is that they build the relationship with us as professionals. We have a chaplain now for the first time paid at Columbia University. And uh, uh, she was hired to do a, uh, a as an intern, and they're, uh, we're hoping that she can get hired full time. The dean of students at Columbia College is a Seventh Day Adventist, um, so that's a place where we're really hoping that we can grow. But that's the great need. We have ACF groups in Canada. We don't have any chaplain full time doing public campus ministry. So I put that as a challenge. We have lots of resources at Advent Source, the Campus Catalyst Guide, Public Campus Ministry Quick Start Guide, and a lot of books for small group ministry. Um, and the professional groups for campus ministry say, give the same kind of standards. It's one thing if you're going to be pastor working with just a group of your denomination. But if you want to be recognized by the university as somebody we can call upon to minister to the whole campus population, you've got to meet the same standards of respect and inclusivity and non-proselytizing. And then we'll, call, then we'll make you a member of the team and have you be, live from your strength. And what are the things Adventists have that we can bring to bear in the campus ministry environment? Our health message. How many students want to be vegans? How many students are dealing with stress? How many students are thinking of suicide? All these issues where lots of universities are looking to partner with us. In Houston, I used to have the VP for student health come from University of Houston come and talk with my campus ministers every couple of years. Just tell us what you're seeing among students. What do we need to know of a major inner city university that students are dealing with. And my chaplain there had a relationship with him and was trusted and that head of student health knew that he could call on some chaplains for students who needed spiritual care that his six psychiatrists on staff could not handle. I'm going to zip through that. Military chaplaincy, just a quick two minutes. Here's a belt buckle. Anybody know what that symbol is? 
Actually, I'm wearing it right now. That's the old Canadian chaplain corps symbol. A Maltese cross in the Latin saying, in hoc signo vinces. In this sign, conquer. Well, uh oh. Somebody, that just clicked. No signal. Okay, well, I'll just tell this. <laughs> so they click, they changed to an, uh, a uh, not so much imperialistic Christian symbol. But this saved my life one day. I was doing a, uh, I picked it up at Gagetown in New Brunswick and bought it at the little PX. And my soldiers went out on the town in St. John drinking one night. I was sent to kind of pastor them. Civilian clothes with this and came the bewitching hour and I had to go round up my soldiers. I go into one bar and a soldier runs away from me down a hall. And I go after him and three big guys come towards me. They all seem to be about that tall, about that wide, very muscular, and said, why are you chasing our friend? I said, it's past his bedtime and I need to take him back and tuck him in. I said, well, we're off duty uh, uh, Canadian MPs. We'll, we'll, t we'll take care of him. So I said, well, I appreciate the help, but uh, uh, he's really my responsibility. And they took steps closer. They grew. They expanded. They said, you didn't hear us. We're going to take care of this. And then one of them looked down. He's a padre. <laughs> what? You're a padre? Yeah. And he's my soldier. And I need to take get him. Well, gee, our padre never comes looking for us when we're in trouble. We'll go get him for you. <laughs> And it was just such an amazing story for me because they knew what a chaplain was. As soon as they saw that magic word, padre, as they talk about chaplains, uh, it was uh, all they needed to say, okay, we need to help you. And they were just amazed that 2 o'clock in the morning or whatever it was, there was a late closing hour at that bar, that a chaplain is there looking after his soldiers. I'll pick up the other slides at a, another time in one of my other presentations because I do t talk about a little bit about some issues right now in the Canadian military that I want to mention. Uh, but again, I use those examples just illustrative of the basic principles. These themes that we have against all these areas of chaplaincy, some of these skills that we'll be looking at, and I'm going to look some more at some of the professional standards and things, this is what we do, to be that presence of Christ in those places where the church may never be seen and nobody else might experience that healing love of Christ. So, glad to be with you. We're going to have a break and Dave has an announcement. Oh, okay, go ahead. Circle of Hope Network, doing life and being church together.